Now, we hear people call sometimes for energy independence, and what they tend to mean is we will try to increase domestic production of oil, uh, Alaska, the continental shelf, and if they're honest about it, they'll say, maybe, you know, we could reduce our share of imports from two-thirds of our imports to 60% of our imports or something. Look, the bulk of the world's oil is not here, and the cheap oil, it to, cheap to lift, to exploit, is overseas in the Persian Gulf. So OPEC, no matter if we go to, say, 60% instead of 67% of our oil uh, coming from abroad, OPEC is still going to set the price. It is a monopoly. Monopolies do that. We don't have control just because we slightly increase our own share of production. So uh, we are in a situation such that we have to take some dramatic and uh, decisive actions. I think by moving toward plug-ins, we will be able to do that. First of all, the economic incentives to the average driver can be stunning. I drive an A123 converted Prius uh, plug-in, and I, uh, uh, when I'm driving on grid power here in the Washington, D.C. area, I'm driving at about two cents a mile. Uh, if uh, we had off-peak overnight pricing, it would be about one cent a mile. Gasoline's about 16, headed up. Uh, I uh, uh, can uh, today, using the photovoltaics on my roof and the batteries in the basement, if I wanted to get off the, the grid for a night just to demonstrate, I could be driving entirely on sunlight for about uh, uh, 20 miles. Now, this, these are early steps, these are early adopter steps that people are taking right now. But saying they're not going to go anywhere is like looking at a several thousand dollar five pound cell phone in its own little suitcase in the early 1980s and say, well, who's gonna be interested in having cell phones? I mean, clearly they're always gonna be big like that and heavy and expensive, right? Wrong. The improvements in battery technology, the improvements in photovoltaics, the improvements in a number of types of technology are going to make it possible, or beginning to make it possible, for us to utilize electricity in a very decisive fashion, not only to save money for consumers, not only to produce the energy that we use for uh, driving uh, and for transportation uh, domestically, but to be cleaner. Pacific Northwest National Laboratory study, along with one from uh, EPRI and Natural Resources Defense Council, make it quite clear that in the country as a whole, on average, 20, 30 percent of uh, uh, your global warming gases that you emit from an internal combustion engine, uh, you are basically improving that by 20 or 30 percent by shifting uh, to a plug-in. And in a clean grid area like the West Coast, you're improving at 80 to 90 percent. In one or two states that are very heavy coal, you're at the margin or maybe not improving it. Uh, but as the grid cleans up, as Dan pointed out, the, as the grid is cleaned up, the cars will be uh, uh, cleaned up uh, as well. And Pacific Northwest study also indicates you can have over three quarters of the cars on the road be plug-ins before you need a single new power plant. Because with time of day pricing and a smart grid, you can move in such a direction as to do your charging at night or do it in such a way that it doesn't uh, stress the grid. That is also helped, of course, by the improvements in batteries and storage. And finally, one interesting thing about driving on electricity is that it is so cheap compared to liquid fuels. I believe it helps protect the alternative liquid fuels, such as ethanol, methanol, butanol, from the Saudis and OPEC doing to them what they did in the mid-80s when they drove the price of oil down and bankrupted their competitors, and then again in the late 90s when they did something of the same thing. Um, if they can't make real progress toward destroying competition by turning on their reserve capacity and driving the price way down, I don't think they're going to get started because uh, it is, uh, uh, to uh, put it mildly, extraordinarily difficult for them to think, even think of competing with one to two to three cent per mile uh, electricity. They'd have to drive oil down to something close to their lifting price of three or four dollars a barrel. They're not going to do that. I don't think they embark on that tack 
to try to destroy their liquid fuel competitors if electricity is there and getting an ever larger share of the market every year. So at least in, in my judgment, we are also protecting these alternative liquid fuels by moving toward electricity. And if you have a plug-in that gets in the ballpark, let's say, of 100 miles a, a gallon, which is about what I get with, uh, with mine, and it's also a flexible fuel vehicle, so you're driving on 85% some alternative liquid instead of gasoline, you're now up in the ballpark of 400 to 500 miles a gallon of gasoline. And if you build that plug-in out of uh, carbon composites, 10 times more crash resistant than steel and half the weight, like what's now going into high-end sports cars and Formula One racers and, uh, and the Boeing 787, um, you double the mileage again. You're now headed up close to 1,000 miles per gallon of petroleum-based fuel. I made those statements at a conference some months ago, and a friend from uh, a major power in the Middle East that exports a lot of oil uh, came up to me afterward and said, Jim, 1,000 miles a gallon. You're going to destroy my country. And I said, we don't want to destroy you, but we do think you ought to get real work. <laughs> if we move decisively toward electricity, we can begin to help with a huge number of problems. But we should not be trying to do this in moderation. We should not be trying to do it over some really long-term period. We should get ourselves in gear, hopefully in the next few months, but if not then, with the new administration of either Obama or McCain, and move out decisively. The way the United States moved to take charge of its economic changes in 19, early 1942, matching the President's call for mobilization to do it. We need to do to oil analogous, something analogous to what was done to salt at the end of the 19th century. Annie Corrin came up with this wonderful analogy. Salt was the only way to preserve meat until very late in the 19th century. It had a monopoly. Believe it or not, countries went to war over salt mines. If you had a salt mine, you could dominate your neighbor. It was a very big deal. Today, the salt on the lunch table out there, you know where it came from? Are we salt independent? <laughs> Do you care? Does anybody care unless they're in the salt business? Of course not. It's a useful commodity that does some things and we buy and sell it in international commerce. Nobody dominates their neighbor anymore because they have a salt mine. We need to do that to oil. And we can do it with electricity the way it, electricity affected salt monopolies in the late 19th century. We can, we should, and we must as a major national priority, destroy oil's monopoly. Absolutely, totally, completely destroy oil's monopoly. Thank you.